Avalanche devils, hurricane Fearing Buckler Rangers, Bruins, Maple Leafs It's a Buckler The goal of many Is that cup of Stanley Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of Here in Puckburg on the Belly Up Sports Podcast Network. I'm your host, Kyle Sullivan, a.k.a. Shaggy Von Doom, with another episode of Puck Tales. Woo-woo! And the you-know-who at the other end of the woo-hoo is none other than Cam Connor. And if you don't know the story of Cam Connor, oh, you're in for a treat, because Cam Connor is on today. Former NHLer, he's from winnipeg manitoba and he has an incredible story and you can also hear cam's story on his own podcast view from the penalty box with cam and chris so cam first of all thank you so much for coming on it is my pleasure thank you and it's i've been a fan of your show for a long long time and it's funny like getting to hear your story and me being from birmingham and you having experiences with the old Birmingham Bulls before the SPHL version. Um, and also getting to be growing up as a friend of uh, Ra- <laughs> Rowdy Roddy Piper, uh, a big, big fan of his. Like you have a incredible story and I wanted to have you on to talk about it. So why don't you tell me about where it all began for you? What about the game of hockey stood out to you where you're like, you know what? I think this might be my avenue. Well, I'll start from uh, 19 years old. Um, Well, let's go to 17. I played junior hockey. So in Canada, there's junior hockey just at the provincial levels. And when you get better than that, you go to the highest level, which Mm -hmm. is in Western Canada called the Western Hockey League. So at 17, you know, I played football. I played lacrosse. I, I played every sport, honest to God. And um, I was always physical. And I remember my coach when I was younger, he said, Kim, take the body out there. So I never forgot that. And so with football and all the contact, um, I carried that over into hockey. And hockey is a contact sport. Mm -hmm. And so when you start banging guys on the ice, they take exception to that. So the fights will come. Yeah. So I'm 17 years old playing against 19 and 20 year olds and uh, wasn't getting a lot of ice time, but I got out there and I ran around like just like a normal game. And I got an awful lot of penalty minutes Then 18, same thing, got a lot of penalty minutes and some goals and some points. At 18, I made the Western Hockey League with a team called the Winnipeg Junior Jets. And uh, we went on a three-week road trip, and it was rough hockey back then. That's when the Philadelphia Flyers had the Broad Street Bullies and Boston Bruins were tough, and it was really aggressive hockey. Like, it was it was lunacy. So we went on this three-week road trip at 18, and uh, we were playing a lot of tough, tough teams out there. And before we went on the road trip, the coach, you know, I'm a rookie then, the coach says, you know, it's going to be really rough hockey these three weeks. And uh, the only guys allowed to fight is Cam and Blair. And Blair and I look at each other like, like that's three weeks of hockey game. And so, you know, they hardly gave me any shifts and they just sent me out to fight. Mm-hmm. I did it. But as soon as we come back after the three week road trip, I quit. I said, you know what? You give me a regular shift, things will happen. But if you want me to be the goon and just go out and fight, I'd, I'd, I'd rather not play for you. Yeah. So this guy, he put it in the paper, the coach, I was in, and he cut me up in the paper. Mm. So at 19, there is a team called Flint Flon Bombers, which was in the same high junior level as Winnipeg was. And uh, that is the home of Bobby Clark, the famous flyer. Mm-hmm. And Philadelphia, um, you know, Flint Flon, um, 
was a mining town of about 10,000 people. So I didn't know when you played for Flin Flon Bombers, you had to work in the mines. Mm. So if you're 19 years old, you go in the, in the mines. If you're 18 and you're not going to school, they give you a shovel and you got to stay outside for uh, about five hours and shovel like all the sidewalks in Flin Flon downtown. Wow. And so it's cold up there. I mean, yeah. It's really cold. <laughs> So the first day of work, um, you had to be there for 6.30 in the morning. And they send you down a mine shaft. And my first day of work, I was 3,750 feet underground. And they give you a power pack, a helmet with a light on it, just like you see in TV. And down we went. And oh, my God. So, you know, I had six, seven months of working in the mines. And so after we'd get up about noon hour, 1230, and we'd shower, and then we'd go, because you're black when you come up from yeah. those mines, and ble- breathing in all, because there's a lot of dynamite going off, and uh, there's no signs up. If you went, wandered around the mines, and you went the wrong direction, you could go in a shaft that there were dynamiting and all of a sudden you hear boom and you see all this smoke coming at you so you go up and you blow your nose and it was black from being oh. so then we went over to the rink and we skated for two hours and um so when the season started the coach he saw something in me and uh, he was the same coach as bobby clark's coach his name was patty janelle and Flint Flon is a nine-hour bus ride away from Winnipeg, uh, nine hours from a place called Regina, which is where the great Clark Gillies played. And so if you reverse that, when somebody's coming to Flint Flon to play us, they got nine hours of a bus ride to get there. Mm. And so our coach, you know, that mining town is a pretty tough spot. And so he just made sure he had a tough team. And so he would tell us, you know what, when the other teams get up here, I don't care what the score is, you run them the whole first period. I don't care what the score is. Just make their life hell. So I could do that. And um, so he started off with four assistant coaches, assistant captains, and then uh, the league said that you have to um, have a captain. So the other three guys – were there for three years. They've been in that league three years. I was a rookie at 19, but he named me captain. And so, you know, nobody's ever shown their confidence in me before. And I felt that every practice I had to be first in every drill. And then when we're playing on the ice and somebody's roughing up one of my players, I was like a guard dog with sheep. Mm. I had to be the first guy in there. And um, so after eight games in Flin Flon, I had no points, 82 penalty minutes, and a two-game suspension <laughs> because this, you know, you mentioned, you know, Roddy Piper. So, you know, Rod and I were best friends from about 16, 17 years old, right up to the day he died and um, was at his funeral. And so... Rod and I used to put the gloves on and spar and do, you know, a bunch of boxing. Rod, he was a trained fighter. He could box. He won. uh, He said he was the light heavyweight champ in Toronto, which, you know, they have a population, I don't know, 5, 10 million. There's lots of people there. So, you know, we would spar. And um, so I could look at you back in those days. And uh, I knew I could take, I just have to look at it. I'd say, their history. So this guy was trying to get at me in Flint Flon, and and I was trying to get at him. And the refs kicked us both out, and he was chirping, and he got me really pissed. So I'm in my dressing room. The game starts again. I I didn't have a lot of self-control, so I said, heck with this. I walked over to his dressing room with my gear on and my skates, and I beat him up (laughs) in his dressing room. And so... That's, you know, I got my two-game suspension because of that. Today, you probably get 40 games. I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> so, you know, like I said, I had no points after eight games. But at the end of the year, I played 62 or 64 games. And I got 47 goals, 
40 something assists, 90 something points, and just under 400 penalty minutes. Wow. And so those stats showed that I could score and I could also be aggressive. And because of that, and I never planned on being a hockey player because I didn't think I had the ability. Mm. And uh, my dad was pretty negative with myself. And so I just didn't really believe in myself and my abilities. But Rod, he was somebody that uh, always made me feel positive and gave me a lot of confidence. So, you know, Rod, sure, he wasn't on the ice with me, but he sure helped me um, just believe in myself. And so I I never have set goals. Maybe I should. But um, in Flin Flon, when the year was over and, and they have you billeting with families, I was emptying out a drawer and there was a piece of paper in that drawer. And I looked at it and I didn't even remember I put it in there. And it was a goal, what I would like to do, you know, as far as accomplishments on the ice. So I had wrote down if I could get 25 goals and 25 assists and maybe 250 penalty minutes, maybe I could be a fifth or sixth round draft choice. And, uh, you know, I never thought about it. I just went out. I didn't think about being drafted once the, you know, I, I, I started playing in Flin Flon. Um, I just did my very best every single practice and every game. And, um, and it wasn't until probably, I don't know, March, April, I was reading a paper. And in the paper, it said, Camp Connor is going to be a uh, first round draft choice. And I went, whoa. <laughs> and I, I had to read that article like five times because <laughs> I couldn't really believe it. And so as it works out, um, I was the number five draft choice, you know, in the whole league. Clark Gillies was number four. Wow. Uh, Clark had a lot better career than me. Um, I I would sure like to do it all over again and uh, just really believe in the abilities that I had, but uh, I, I didn't. So anyways, that's where it all started. And uh, I went to the World Hockey because they offered me, as I was told, the most money ever paid to a junior hockey player going there. And so I remember, you know, I asked my agent, is that Montreal's final offer? And it was a team called Phoenix Roadrunners in the rival league, the World Hockey, which paid as much, if not more. Mm -hmm. And so my agent said, yeah, that's everybody's final offer. And so I said, okay, because I never followed hockey growing up. I just didn't. Yeah. Um, it, it, I would rather play it than watch any sports, really. <laughs> so um, I said, okay, well, I'll go to Phoenix. And uh, they put it in the paper because they didn't have cell phones or anything back in those days. So it was in the paper. And this coach, Scotty Bowman, and Sam Pollock, his name is. Sam is uh, one of the best ever GMs of the hockey team. And um, they were traveling. They were in Buffalo driving to Montreal. They stopped for gas, and they read it in the paper that I was going to sign with the rival league. So they got a hold of me. I was at my girlfriend's, who is my wife's now. I don't know how they got the number. No idea. But they just said, well, what are you doing? What are you doing? You're going to be on Guy Lafleur's line. All Canadians want to play for Toronto or Montreal. They didn't know I never followed hockey. I didn't know that. <laughs> so anyways, um, they said, well, why, why would you go there? I said, well, here's what you offered me, and here's what they offered me. And he said, it's money, that's it? I said, yeah. He said, well, stay on the phone. I will get you another $200,000. Wow. So that's a million dollars today. Wow. I bought my first car, Trans Am, fully loaded. It cost me, and I didn't know you could negotiate a sticker price. <laughs> Back in those days, it cost me $6,500. Wow. So <laughs> and it, like, it, the stat was the sign, like my signing bonus was 200 grand. Yeah. So long story short, 
I just said, I, I, I can't. They said, well, did you sign with them? I said, I didn't. And uh, they said, well, then you could, you could change your mind. I said, no, I gave them my word. I, I said, I gave them my word I'd sign with them. And he said, well, yeah, but legally you're okay. But, you know, in hindsight, I should never have gone to the World Hockey. I should have gone right to the National Hockey League because that year Montreal had five number one, like first round draft choices, five first rounders. And the other four guys went to Montreal and I was the only one that didn't. And they got four or five Stanley Cup rings. And so, anyway, so I went to Phoenix and then I went to Houston Arrows in the World Hockey. Played with the great Gordy Howe and uh, his sons, Mark and Marty Howe. And I learned a lot from all of, all three of them. They're, they were wonderful people. That league had folded. And so... I just signed a seven-year no-cut, no-trade contract with uh, Houston Arrows. And uh, they folded after two years, so I went to Montreal. And uh, it was tough for me there because I'd mentioned how my dad was so negative. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the year before when I was in Houston, I played the two years there. I got 35 goals in 200, I don't know, 50 penalty minutes. And uh, then the next year, I, I, I broke my hand in a fight, and I had 21 goals at that point. And the coach was one of the nicest guys you'd ever want to meet. He was just always positive, and uh, I just thrived with that guy. I don't know about you, but if you want to get the best out of me, it's not through negative reinforcements. It's through pats on the back yeah, and, and making me feel good. And I, I will give you everything I got. Yeah. When I got to Montreal, Scotty Bowman, the, just the first week we were in Buffalo exhibition game, I leave my hotel room, walking down the hallway, Bowman's coming towards me. I just say, oh, hi, Scotty. He just looks at the ceiling, keeps walking by. And I go, I don't think this guy likes me. <laughs> and so he never smiled. He was always giving me shit. And so one of the guys named Steve Shutt, who'd been there for – seven, eight years. He said, you know, Scotty's mean to everybody. He said, but I got to say, he's the, he, you know, he, he's been the meanest to you than anybody. I said, mm. yes, that is. so I was afraid to make mistakes on the ice and you probably didn't even notice I was out there. I was just making sure I stayed on my wing. And I just really didn't get involved and I didn't play very well. And, uh, but I never complained. They get reporters who would say, Cam, they should be giving you more ice time. They should be dressing you more. And I never said a word. I never said a word. I never complained. And uh, I think the guys in the team, they appreciated that. Um, and when I was in the in the stands and I noticed something, between periods I go down and I tell the guys, here's what's going on from up there. Because, you know, it's so easy to play the game from mm -hmm. the stands. Yeah. So anyways, I, I never complained. I never bitched. And uh, at the end of the year, um, I didn't play enough games. You have to play 40, and I played 20-something games. And then I played all the playoff games except for the last Stanley Cup Finals against the New York Rangers, and I had uh, got food poisoning in the Series 4, and I got it really bad that they misdiagnosed it and I had the poison in my system for nine days. Mm. And I went from 206 pounds down to 180. I couldn't walk straight. It, it was really hard. And so I didn't get to play that last series. So I didn't even know that my name wasn't supposed to go on the Stanley Cup. I was never out and sent to the farm team. I was there all year. So... Um, Probably, I would say, 15, 20 years later, I found out about this. And what had happened was the NHL said, well, Cam doesn't qualify to get his name on the cup. And there was another Hall of Famer by the name of Yvonne Cornway. Mm -hmm. And I think he's won, I'm going to just say, six Stanley Cups. Yeah. Tremendous. He'd been the captain of the team. And uh, he, the first week of the season... He had disc problems, and so they operated on his back, 
and he was out for the whole season. So they said he didn't qualify either. So we had three player representatives, which was a guy named Bob Ganey, Ken Dryden, and Doug Riseboro. And what they said was, if you don't put Camp Connor's name on the Stanley Cup, and you don't put Yvonne Cornway's name on the Stanley Cup, you do not have permission to put anybody else's name on the Stanley Cup. Just put down Montreal Canadiens in the year. That is it. Well, the NHL, they can't um, really have that happen. So <laughs> he said, well, we'll make an exception this year. But I didn't know that those guys went to bat for me. And I'll be forever grateful. You know, you know, I've got the ring and I've got the memories. But really, it's like when my son and daughter and their families, when they're in Toronto, where they have the, you know, I don't know what it's called, Hockey Hall of Fame, I believe. Mm-hmm. And they got the Stanley Cup in there. You know, they can look at it and see my name and be proud and, you know, that's that's really important to me. And so, uh, again, I'll never forget those guys. And uh, then the next year, there was a merger with the World Hockey. And so four teams moved over. So Winnipeg Jets, Houston, uh, Winnipeg Jets, Edmonton Oilers, I think it was, I want to say Quebec Nordiques. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure about that. Not sure about the now it wasn't Quebec, it was Hartford Whalers. Anyways, there was there was four teams, anyways. Maybe it was I don't know. I can't I, remember. I believe it was Quebec is that fourth. Was it team. Quebec? Was it? Because I yeah, okay, maybe. Yeah, you probably yeah. I just don't remember. But anyways, so Glenn Sather, who was a coach GM for Edmonton, he mm-hmm. uh they had the expansion draft, and uh, I played against him in the World Hockey. So he made me the number one choice, and he phoned me up. I was in Montreal, and that's where the draft was. And he said to me, uh, Cam, we made you the first pick. You're going to be in Edmonton for a long time, buy a house. And uh, he said, hey, could you do me a favor? What's I said, yeah, what? He said, what are you doing right now? I said, I'm just sitting at home. Well, we got this, uh, one of our players is here in Montreal, but he doesn't know anybody. He's just sitting in his room. Could you take him out for a beer or something? I said, sure, sure. So he told me what hotel. And I said, who's the player? He said, well, it's it's Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> and I said, and I didn't know much about Wayne because it, when I left the World Hockey, they, there was one more year before they merged. He joined the World Hockey. So I pick up Wayne. And uh, we are sitting in a bar just talking. And he said, Cam, you know, you played in the world hockey and you played in the NHL. Is there a big difference between the two leagues? I said, yeah, there really is. Now, the reason I say that, when I played on the expansion Edmonton Oilers, it was no different than the world hockey. But when you play for Montreal and – you know, they'd won the Stanley Cup three years in a row. And it's like Scotty Bowman said, all Canadians want to play for Toronto or Montreal. And so when the teams, even if you were lousy, like Pittsburgh was bad, Vancouver Canucks was bad, even when they played us, they played at another level. Yeah. And I said, oh, wow, this is a fast league. This is a good league. So I didn't really realize you know, why everybody looks so good. So then I figured it out, you know, when I went to Edmonton and they didn't get up as much, right? And so I told Wayne, I said, Wayne, I know you've had some success in your hockey career, but it's going to take you a year or two, I said, before, you know, you catch on. And he kind of looked at me kind of, (laughs) okay. and Because he has so much confidence in his ability and he should. So that year I played with him. He scored 136 points, and he tied with Marcel Dion for the scoring championship. And I think they gave it to Marcel because he had more goals than Wayne. And so in Edmonton, there was Messier and Gretzky and Kevin Lowe. They were all 18 years old. And uh, as I've said many times before, which is true, if uh, I had known that those three guys were going to have the kind of career that they did, 
I definitely would have had him over for supper a lot more. <laughs> so, anyway, so and then I heard on the radio I got traded from Edmonton to New York. And I can't blame Sather because, as I mentioned to you, when I got that food poisoning, I, I carried that all summer. I had problems. I couldn't walk. I couldn't train. I was, I, nobody could, I saw six orthopedic surgeons. I, I went to anybody. And nobody could help me. So when I showed up for training camp, Glenn said, what's the matter with you? And I told him, I said, well, I had food poisoning and I don't know what's going on. And he said, so you're damaged goods. Well, mm -hmm. we're going to have to send you back to Montreal. And I said, I sold my house. I bought one here. Please don't. So he sent me to an 82-year-old doctor. And the doctor said, you know what? You've got some chromosome problems. And uh, I've only seen one other case like you. So he gave me some pills and, you know, it was almost instant relief. So uh, after two weeks, I've missed training camp. I haven't trained all summer. I haven't been able to lift weights. Um, I said, I'm going to skate now. I'm, I'm feeling better. So they, they had 60 guys at training camp. And when I went to get equipment, they said, you know, guys are getting cut tomorrow. You know, just use, and I, they gave me little kid's shin pads. They're, they didn't mm. fit. And so I get on the ice just thinking I'm going to skate for the first time. And the first thing they said, okay, you, we're scrimmaging and Cam, your line starts. I said, what? <laughs> so I get in there and there's a guy named Lee Foglin, big, strong defenseman, big, strong. We took a run at each other. He knocked me over like a bowling pin. <laughs> and I went into the fetal position, flying into the boards. And my kneecap was exposed, and bang, mm. I hit it against the boards, and I cracked my kneecap. And so, oh, I was so disappointed. I remember I I, I, I was crying. I, I just was so happy to play, and now I'm hurt. Well, you know, it kind of was a blessing because I got to work out and get stronger again. My first game back, oh, look out. There was a guy on Chicago named Keith Brown. He was a rookie. He did something to me, so I said, let's go. We square off, and just as I'm throwing a punch at him, my the former captain for the Houston Arrows, he knew I could fight. He he come charging to help. And Brown was a big boy. He wasn't a little guy. Just as I'm throwing the punch, his name was Terry Ruskowski, he bumped me, and my, my the flight path of my fist, instead of hitting him where I was aiming, I hit his helmet. Mm. And broke my freaking hand. First game oh. back. And so, you know, with the injury that I came with and then two more injuries, sometimes you think somebody's maybe a little injury prone. And if you can get rid of them, get rid of them. <laughs> so I think that's what happened to me. And I ended up with the Rangers. And, uh, you know, I, I that's when – the U.S. won the 1980 Olympics with their hockey team. And so the GM was named Craig Patrick. Mm -hmm. So it, the, we had a uh, coach, and his, and his name was Fred Shiro. And so when Craig came in, first thing he did was get rid of Fred Shiro, and he brought Herb Brooks in. And I got along with Herb. And uh, right at the end of the, the season that I got there, I got traded on the trade deadline. I got in a fight and I broke my freaking hand for the third time. And so I know uh, the next year, because it, like my style was a rugged type style, get involved. And uh, I had lots of chances in 12 games, man. I knew it was coming. I knew I was going to start producing, but the, the GM just uh, said, see you later. You're out of here. Sent me to the farm team and, uh, you know, I got a point a game the first season in the farm team in New Haven, Connecticut. I had the most goals um, tied for, I was, I think I played seven games less than the league score, and I was only two points behind them Wow! when the, when the season ended up. And I had the most fights, the most penalty minutes, highest plus minus. I won team MVP. I won every category. And then the coach, the, the coach, they next year, they said, Cam, we'd like you to be the captain of the farm team. I said, no way. And they said, why not? I said, because I want to come back to the NHL. So 
they got Craig Patrick wrote me a letter that said, Cam, yeah, you had a good season, but you never played for us again. And, you know, so I, uh, I didn't get a – and I did good. They brought me up for the playoffs. I had some good playoffs, you know, for the Rangers. But that's that's – that's my career in a nutshell, and to this day, it's going to haunt me forever that I had the ability, but I didn't have the confidence to play, you know, with the, within the ability that I had. So, Well, that's still a very storied career. Like, even you say you look back and there are things that haunt you, but there, there was that moment you talked about earlier in your career where you thought it was just going to be you were going to be sent out there to be the goon and you almost quit the game. And then, yeah. and yeah. then once they made you captain, once you came back and you yeah. realize like I can use this and people rely on me uh, to a point that the team would stand up for me to put my name on the cup. Like yeah. that's, that's, that's something incredible right there. Well, it's uh, again, I, I'm, uh, I will be forever grateful that those guys stepped up and, uh, you know, honored me with going to bat and maybe not having their name on the Stanley Cup. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that, you know, I mean, there were some highlights and I've met some great people and it changed who I was. I was too aggressive growing up in that aggressive house, like way too aggressive that uh, I w I'm a different person. When I started my career, by the time I finished my career, I had mellowed and I learned to laugh at myself. I, you know, I was going bald at about 22, 23 <laughs> years old. And, uh, you know, people would chirp me on the team. Hey, you got a little spot back there. And I'd say, <laughs> F off or, you know, <laughs> challenge them. And, you know, by the end of the my career, I have heard every bald joke you could possibly hear. <laughs> and, you know, it is what it is, right? You play the cards you're dealt in life. If I wasn't meant to have hair, well, that's just the way it is. I could have been something way worse than that. And uh, honestly, and going back to where you uh, talking about looking back and, like, the things that you wish, honestly, if this is a lot of listeners' first time hearing your story, I think a lot of people would be, just do anything to be in your shoes. Like you cross paths with Gordie Howe, Wayne Gretzky and Herb Brooks. Like those are three storied names in the sport, especially Mark, like from Mark, Mark Messier, Messier, Guy Lafleur, Ken Dryden. Like, I mean that Canadians team, I think, honestly, I think 10 of the players on that team are in the hockey hall of fame. So I was very, and I played with Phyllis Bezito yeah. in uh, New York. So I was lucky. Yeah. Yeah, there's that's I mean, you have such an incredible story. And like when you get to hear you tell your story, especially with you and your son on your podcast, like just the heart that you have for everyone that you played with and like the the personality and the you could feel the love for the everybody that you were in that locker room with. And you could it's it's a you got a really good story. And it's one that a lot of people look up to me included. Well, it's it's appreciate appreciated you know what you're saying and uh i think you know all of us when you get to that highest level in sports you always want to do your best mm -hmm. and you know i've had many years to reflect on my career and not sound like a complainer but i just know there was guys i played with that i felt that i had as much ability if not more and i look at the career that they had and what I had, um, I just would like to do it all over again and uh, maybe have the belief in myself to pull out the ability that I had and be yeah. more consistent. But I can't complain. It It's made me a better person playing hockey. And they and they brought you back. What was it for the Heritage Classic, was it? The yes, alumni? Th yes, that's it. And, you know, for some reason, it, and I don't know if you could ever – understand how cold it is <laughs> but in Edmonton we played in the football stadium which holds 60,000 people it was sold mm -hmm. out and it was minus 30 and it with the wind chill when the wind's blowing it's like minus 45 it was oh. so freaking cold 
and the, all the fans showed up. They were dressed like Eskimos. <laughs> it was cold. But, you know, the league never recognized that game as the first outdoor game ever. That was in November of 2003. And uh, when they talk about, you know, the outdoor games and how cold they were, they don't ever mention that one. They don't mention that was the first outdoor game. That's and, true. You know, so it was the Montreal Canadiens alumni against the Edmonton Oilers alumni. In fact, Mark Messier was still playing for the Rangers, and they allowed him to come because Glenn Sather was the GM yeah. of the Rangers, and he was allowed to come and play in the Heritage alumni game for the the uh, Oilers. Wow. And so then right after our game, the NHL Montreal Canadiens and the present Edmonton Oilers, they played the outdoor game. And uh, it was just something else. It was something else. So cold. We had a heaters all over the bench. It was freaking cold. Oh, and, and you had a history with both of those teams. So to be in that environment, in that outdoor environment, no matter how cold it was, I know that had to be a really cool moment. Cool, literally cool. Yeah. <laughs> literally and figuratively, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Cam, I'm not going to take up the rest of your night. I'm telling you, this was an absolute treat to get to hear your story. And for everyone stopping by and hearing your story for the first time, where can they go and find more of your story? And where can they find you? Well, Cam Connor, NHL. And with my son and I, we've had between – and I – didn't keep track, 50, 53 podcasts. And, uh, you know, I talk about my buddy Roddy Piper in the podcasts. And, um, uh, you know, like you said, the view from the penalty box. So, you know, and I, I've got one of my son yeah. had this made. So it's view from the penalty box. And I got two black eyes, <laughs> you know, from fighting. And, um, uh, it, like I said, it, I, I didn't go out and buy my own merchandise. It was a gift to me. So, <laughs> Well, it's I'm telling you, if everyone enjoyed just like the sample of these stories, definitely go check out Cam and Chris and on their show because they go, they really go in depth on their stories and they're, it's just incredible. It's I'm telling you, I'm as a, as a listener myself and a fan myself, they have, they have kept me laughing and just like just awestruck on many of the stories that you experienced. So um, it's definitely worth a follow. Well, I want to thank you for having me on your podcast. And uh, it's been uh, a real treat to go back memory lane and uh, kind of recall my career, the highs and lows. And uh, I, again, I appreciate you having me, Kyle. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And again, if this is everybody's first time stopping by here in Puckburg, you can follow us on Instagram at here in Puckburg. That's here underscore in underscore Puckburg. On Twitter, it's H Puckburg. And you can follow the show on YouTube as well. And on our way out, I'd like to thank you one more time, Cam. Thank you for coming on. And thank you for everybody stopping by here in Puckburg. Woo woo. <laughs>